The old boring church ain't what she used to be. Hallelujah. Things are shifting. And the challenge for you and me is to keep shifting with the shift of God. Keep moving with God. God is moving. And the sad thing is, if God doesn't move in us, he's still going to move. Sometimes he has to move around us and he has to move in spite of us, but he prefers to move with us and through us. That's his first preference. Every individual who belongs to him, he said, I want to use you. You and I are to carry the glory. We are to carry the move of God. We are to cause what God is, is desiring to do, to happen in our lives and our homes, our churches, our regions. So this morning we've been partaking of something bigger than what we see, taking of something regional. When we went out, there was a release. If you can see it in the spirit, it was just no end. It was just as far as faith could release it this morning in the purpose of God. The glory was going out. Don't ever measure it by human reasoning or the feelings we have. It's by faith. When God speaks, he's about to do what he says. As we've always said, that we have to find out what is God saying because then we'll know what God is doing because he does what he says. And so this morning it's been quite a prophetic flow and it's always going to be an element of that because we are an apostolic prophetic church. I don't mean without walls, I mean the body of Christ. This is the season for that fullness of apostolic prophetic anointing to be released because that puts the finishing touches on building the kingdom. The prophetic is the blueprint and the apostolic is the strength to build what God is saying. Hallelujah. And uh, I believe that we're into some exciting times and fabulous times. That's why it's been rough and tough to get there. If you felt like you've been at the very neck of a bottle trying to squeeze through, that's a sign. Someone prophesied recently that the church is coming out of the birth canal, that place of restriction. And uh, without being rude, but there's been enough oil to get us through the birth canal, enough anointing to squeeze us through. And we're coming out the other side. Hallelujah. That's what's happening in the body of Christ. The new thing that God's been preparing. And he's been preparing us for. That's why there's a divine dissatisfaction with church as usual. And it's everywhere. A divine dissatisfaction. It's not just human rebellion. There can be an element of that, but it's actually from God himself. Saying, I am not satisfied with the way things are. And he puts that in our spirit because we're one with him. 1 Corinthians 6.17 Who the one who's joined to the Lord is one spirit. We can feel his heartbeat this morning. We can hear his voice this morning. You can lay your head against his breast. You can pick up how he feels this morning. And it's important that the church relates to God in intimacy so we know how do you feel this morning. It seems a, sometimes a crazy question. How are you, Lord? But you can ask that kind of question. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? He shares his secrets with his prophetic people. He loves doing that. I think he has so few who ask him, how are you feeling, Lord? What's on your heart today, Lord? What's the priority of my prayer this morning, Lord? And he loves sharing. He loves sharing. He's the best communicator in the world. But humanity are the worst listeners. He's the best speaker, the best communicator. He just wants us to learn and listen. Amen. Isaiah 42, 9, verse 8, sorry. I'm the Lord, that's my name. And my glory I'll not give to another, neither to any graven image. Behold, former things have come to pass, new things I declare, and before they spring forth I will tell you. That's why our prophetic people have ears to hear. Before they happen, I'm going to tell you. And Isaiah 43, verse 19, verse 18, Remember not the former things, neither consider things of old. Behold, I'll do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall ye not know it. I'll even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Or I'll even push you through the birth canal. I'll get you through into the next realm of glory. Hallelujah. Many, many associated scriptures regarding the new thing God is wanting to do. God is a God of newness. That's why we're so excited about meeting with him corporately because something new happens every time. Something different happens. There's a different facet, a different expression of the Lord's nature and heart and purpose. So we know according to Luke chapter 5, and this is the parable that I believe is so very relevant to us in this generation, Luke chapter 5, and beginning in verse 30, let's have a look, 36. He spoke a parable to them. This is the words of Jesus. No man puts a piece 
of a new garment upon an old garment. Otherwise, both the new makes a, a tear and the piece that was taken out of the new doesn't fit with the old. Verse 37, Luke chapter 5, No man puts new wine into old bottles or old wineskins or else the new wine will burst the wineskin and be spilled and the bottles will perish or the wineskin shall perish. Verse 38, you might want to read that with me, but new wine must be put into new bottles and both are preserved. Must be. You might want to underline that in your, in your mind. New wine must be put into new wineskins, new bottles. Must be, must be, must be, must be. The words of Jesus, who is our Lord and our Saviour, our truth this morning. Now this is something that the body of Christ has wrestled with for many, 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 many years that we don't just continue an old thing when God himself is doing a new thing. Lest we be found with Ichabod written upon the medium. Ichabod means the glory is gone, the glory is departed. Just like the glory cloth just disappeared then. <laughs> so for many uh, uh, gatherings, they're no longer in the spirit but they're now in tradition and they're building with traditional results. doesn't mean God's not there because God loves people and he isn't a God who abides. He says, I'm not leaving, I'll never leave, I'll never forsake. But what is missing is the cutting edge of the anointing which brings change, the cutting edge that forges a path into the unknown territory. That's missing. And once you've tasted the cutting edge of God, you are so frustrated if you can't find it again. You just keep looking for it. Where are you moving, God? What are you saying? What are you doing? And you desperately need to get back on that edge and begin to move with him. Hallelujah. It's not as complicated as people make out. Two questions. What are you saying, Lord? And then you know what he's going to do. Because what he says is what he does. So we have a problem. It's an ongoing problem. It's an issue even in this city today in a fairly large degree. The old pattern of doing things, outmoded traditions, ineffective structures, obsolete philosophies that are coming from this age, creaking and cracking institutions and old habits, many of which are bad. So we have a new thing happening in the spirit but we have an old thing that's trying to impede the new thing that God is doing. This, this is in every generation the same. The wine and the wine skin. The wine, of course, is the life of the spirit. It's the gospel of Christ. It's the truth of God. That's the wine. That's the, um, the power of the, of the spirit moving in and through us. But the wine skin is the way we do things, the pattern of doing it, the form and the structure, the the behaviours that come around uh, activity in church life. And so what God says, he doesn't say look back and condemn, he says let's find out what's not working and let's move with that which is working for this season. As God moves, the old wineskin begins to bind up the power of the gospel. As God moves, God is always moving. Remember this, God is always moving. It's just a sense when there's this corporate agreement with God that we sense the move of God. That God is always moving. He's never static at any given moment in time. He's a God of newness. He's moving every day. He's moving. But when you begin to discern a move of God, it means it's gathered momentum and there's enough people in agreement who are saying something's changing. Let's agree with what God is doing and let's move with him. God initiates the move. We do not initiate a move of God. We hunger for the move of God. We cry out for the move of God. We ask God to do something to help us but it comes from heaven. The cry comes from earth but God's uh, revelation and the truth is coming straight out of heaven. That's why we've got ears that are tuned towards heaven, hearts that are listening to God. But the old wineskin has the power to bind up the power of the gospel. It hinders, it resists and uh, it, it, the potency of the wine is unable to be fully expressed but the time comes when the wineskin bursts and I think we are seeing the bursting of wineskins in this season right across the city but even the whole world there's a bursting, there's a bursting. The old structure cannot contain what the Spirit's doing. There's such an immediacy in the Spirit. God alone knows the hour, he knows the time and you just sense this uh, acceleration in the spirit because he knows the time. If it was, well, there's so much time, it's business as usual. A season where God just winks at things. We've had those kind of seasons and uh, it's changed. Hallelujah, it's changed. He's not just winking at the problems. He's saying, it's time. 
it's time. And you feel the pressure all around you but it's a good thing because it's actually propelling us towards our destiny in God, pushing us through out of the old into the new. So understand the frustration and then you can handle it better. Give it to the Lord and just rejoice that something's happening. But the wineskins are bursting and the power and the glory of God is beginning to break forth. Hallelujah. So that passage in Luke 5, meditate on it and just dig deep as the Holy Spirit gives you full revelation of what's happening there. Particularly that uh, verse 38, the new wine must be, must be, must be put into new wineskins. It's not an option for us to do things as usual. We must respond to what God is saying in this hour. Jesus is distinguishing here between something which is essential and primary and something which is secondary but it's still needful and it's good. But the essential thing is you must have the wine. The essential thing is the wine, the truth, the the anointing, the power, the glory. You must have that. That's the essential ingredient here. About the secondary uh, is the wine skin, but it's necessary. You still have to have a wine skin. You still have to have some kind of Holy Spirit structure so that the wine is not spilled. Some people say, I don't want any structure. Well, what happens is the, the wine spills. It goes in all directions and very few actually get hold of the blessing because it's just scattering all over the place. So there's got to be a, in the mind of God a way to do things to allow the full potency of the wine to touch the world. Uh, where the wineskin meets the world, that's the key. It's all right for you and me today to say, oh, I'm full of new wine, I'm full of new wine. But the world in all its uh, decaying state needs the wine. It needs the wine to be poured out freely upon its death so it might come back to life. Hallelujah. What you and I are doing today should affect how we live this afternoon and tomorrow until we may meet again. Not necessarily corporately, but believers gathering together for the sake of church. Church is for church. Church is not for unbelievers. I mean, unbelievers are very welcome, but they won't understand a lot of what happens until they get saved. I mean, it's wonderful to bring visitors and I'm all in for that. But church actually is for church. Church is a tactical headquarters to get the mind of the spirit to be built up, to get the battle plan for the next season, to be strengthened, the body edifies itself in love, Ephesians 4, all the parts function, the gifts and the anointings bring a fullness and back out we go again. So that the wine can actually touch the world. Now this is not a new revelation and no one's gasping with, oh my revelation. But nevertheless it's an important truth to hear again and again and again. Someone could do that, I'd feel great if someone, you know, re- oh Phil I've never heard this before. So the wineskin is the point of contact between where the wine is and where the world is. That's why this morning the Lord said, get that wine outside, get out of the four walls. He wasn't saying it in frustration or anger, he's just prophetically illustrating. You can't hold it in, you can't hold it in. It's got to go to the world. It's got to touch the world and affect the world. So the wine is the most vital thing. That's why you and I are soaking in God and searching scriptures and praying in the Holy Ghost, getting more and more of the Lord. But we have to understand what God requires us to do with it. Hallelujah. The wineskin is important. It's necessary, absolutely necessary. So this is how God moves. He moves with the potency of truth, potency of now truth. Matthew 4.4 4. Man shall not live by, what is it, bread alone, but by... Every word that proceeds in the continuous Greek sense of that word, it's Matthew 4.4, 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that is proceeding out of the mouth of God. It's the now word. What are you saying now, Lord? What's urgent for this season? What's the priority for this season? And that's, that's where the heavy, strong anointing is on the now word. All the word is true. All of the scripture, thy word is truth. But there's a now word. What are you emphasising? And you and I know how it works. You know how from the Logos the Rhema comes. You're reading and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit highlights things. Well, in seasons God does the same. The Holy Spirit using the very truth, the book of truth, thy word is truth, Old and New Testament, all truth, God begins to highlight, emphasise certain things and they become the front line of the battle. And it changes with seasons. That's why when nothing changes, you know it's religion. You know you're stuck in some kind of tradition and you're not moving with what God is saying. So the condition of the world is really causing God to move. The cry that's coming from, I believe the church as well, but he's hearing the cry of the world. 
and is responding. Now, a move of God has, by nature, an undercurrent. Like any move of water, you sometimes see the water flowing on the surface, but it's the undercurrent that has the power to take it in the direction that it's needing to go. There's an undercurrent and uh, I believe that uh, you can begin to discern the undercurrent things God is doing in a major move. This is a worldwide move that you and I are part of now, worldwide move of God. And there's a number of distinctive undercurrents that are happening. One is a great emphasis on personal evangelism. This is uh, the fulfilment of the Great Commission, Matthew 28, go into all the world and begin to teach and preach and baptise and make disciples, not just give them the message, make disciples. Biggest challenge I think you and I are facing is how to make a disciple rather than get a convert. You can get a convert relatively easily but making a disciple is something requiring that you and I lay down our lives. Any amens this morning? So God is wanting us to have that whole heart for reaching people. We, uh, I just, uh, during uh, the late news last night, just been praying for the media and has flicked on the news and you might have um, seen where the couple, I think Balladura, came out of the pub on their way home and a car knocked them over and she was killed. I realised by looking at the news and the photo, we know her. We knew her from a season past. She's not a Christian as far as I know up to this point. And straight away the anguish of my heart, where is she now? Where is she now? Where is she now? Sometimes you look back with regret thinking maybe I should have said more, maybe we could have really. You know, you've got to pick up the promptings of the Holy Spirit because every heart, every life is so valuable and that brought it home, life is fleeting, so fleeting and she's gone into eternity somewhere. So personal evangelism is an undercurrent of a move of God. You cannot, you cannot separate a move of God from a heart for people and uh, the fulfilment of the Great Commission. Go and tell the people and... Um, I believe power evangelism is one of the fresh ways that God is moving. It's not, it's not fresh, it's Acts, the book of Acts, but it's fresh in our generation that now we're going out with the power of the gospel, with miracles and mainstream in the streets and signs and wonders and healings and deliverance. And you know there's major deliverance happening with people in the streets today. People are witnessing in the next thing manifestations of darkness coming out of people. Hallelujah, roll it on Jesus. Miracles were always mainstream in the life of Jesus. I mean, the only time he's, he's huddled in the, in, the, in the temple, of course, there's a healing in the temple and there's a healing with Peter and John at the gates of the temple, but everything else is out there with the people. Hallelujah. Sometimes not a lot of healing in the temple because there's too much unbelief. So God says, well, let's take the power out to where people are hungry to hear it. And they don't raise uh, the unbelief that sometimes we do. They've got, they've got arguments and problems, but God knows their, their, you know, the conditioning of their heart and the grace and the mercy just seems to come through more easily when there's unbelief in the, in the household of faith. That itself is a resistance that God finds hard to tolerate. But we're getting there, faith to faith, faith to faith. Say this, I'm going from faith to faith. Faith to faith, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So power evangelism is important. The whole gospel with the signs following. And I'm not just talking personal signs. When Jesus uh, was uh, collecting, uh, the, sorry, when Jesus was training the disciples, he was uh, 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 training them to move with personal signs. And uh, the signs are in all the four gospels the, the restoration of sight to the blind, and the healing of the lame, and the deaf is now hearing, and the lame is rejoicing and jumping, and they're speaking in tongues, and all these various signs are out there as personal signs that should accompany every believer, every one of us, because of the, the wine. It's not because of us, it's the wine that's now flowing through us to the world can move with personal signs. Every one of us can, because they're not coming from us, they're coming from God. But, but equally as importantly in terms of the wider picture, social signs. You find that when Christians are active, truly active, particularly when they're moving together corporately, you've got, uh, you know, the signs of, of he healing the sick and the signs of educating the uneducated, the signs of cleansing lepers. This is, this is a great sign throughout all of history. The Christians have done this and they've set up these hospitals and they, they looking after the orphans. I mean, the Christians are way ahead of any other group of people and always have been throughout human history once the gospel came. It's not, not for us to be proud in one sense, but I guess it is in another sense that we lead the way with social signs, justice to the poor, you know, that whole facet of justice. We, we, God is strong on justice. He's strong on looking after the poor. 
He's strong on making sure everyone has their needs met, which is why the early church sold their possessions and shared them around so that there was a, so some kind of equity in the kingdom. Hallelujah. Glory to God. These are, these are how revival not only takes hold but is sustained. So number one, there's an there's a undercurrent in our generation and a tremendous flow of personal evangelism. Secondly, there's church renewal. Someone classified these as movements. So we have the personal evangelism movement. In other words, the move of God is moving towards everyone, winning people for Christ and discipling them. There's a church renewal movement in our very day. What is that? Well, it's making sure the church is coming back into a divine order. It's coming back to the truth. Reformation is the word, straightening things out again. It's stripping off all the carpets to see what the intention of God was underneath. Oh, bare floorboards, polished and beautiful and wonderful, but we've covered it over with all our traditions. God says, strip off the traditions and let's see the original intent of what I've designed and it's beautiful and it's precious. Church renewal. Now, for those who don't sort of like the church thing, yeah, you can't truly walk in the, in the move of God without having an understanding of what church is. Church is not necessarily institutions. Church is not about human organisation. Church is about a living organism that connects together. Twos or threes, thousands, hundreds of thousands. We had a prophecy recently about getting, getting stadiums. This is at a Friday night. An African pastor began to prophesy. I said, I see stadiums and I see you guys, not just us, but guys in the stadiums giving witness to Christ. And he said this, the whole body's ministry. That's what he saw in the spirit. The whole body's ministering. Everyone's carrying the power of God. Thought, yes, Lord. That's the army of God. But church renewal means that God has to get rid of that which is not right and bring us back to the place of what church is really all about. Biblical truth being restored. Solid teaching so we have doctrinal um, truth and, and no, no spirit of error in our lives. Ensuring that the life of God is there. Building true community having godly order. God is doing that today. People say, I don't want to do that. I just want to do the personal evangelism. Yeah, but the undercurrent is personal evangelism plus it's get the church right. You know, God's multi, able to multitask. He's able to do that and this and this and this and everything that needs to be done. Whereas we sometimes get focused, oh yeah, no, it's all about this. No, 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 because someone else says, no, no, it's all about this. It's actually about this and this and this and this and this and this. And we just obey God as to how we're moving with the move of the Spirit. So there's, there's a personal evangelism movement happening today and I believe it needs to increase and I believe more of us need to be on the streets and in public places and marketplaces. And as the Lord leads, everything is as I see the Lord do it. Jesus said, as I see the Father do it, that's what I do. Church renewal, all of us should be interested in getting back to biblical truth and digging deep into the Word and searching that these things be so. Amen? That's all part of it. Thirdly, there's what we see as church growth movement. Church growth movement is churches are multiplying, churches are multiplying. Every local community has an effective church. Maybe every street has a church. Maybe every block has a church. I mean, what, what is church? Two or more gathered in the purpose of God. There's a very large expanding house church movement happening. Worldwide it's happening. Preparation for end times, probably when things can't be as corporate and as public as they are. That's all right. The church is still vitally connected to the Lord and to one another. It's a big movement. In, obviously, you know, in China, the underground church, but in India, there's a massive house church movement. You guys know a bit about that. You've been to the house, part of the house church movement. It's massive. Want to say anything? <laughs> come, come. Who's got the mic? Where'd the mic end up? Look, I'll just briefly say this movement's grown at like about 7,000 house churches a year. The, the growth is phenomenal. But the way they do it, just very briefly, is completely biblical. Now, how it would work in our society, I don't know. But what they do, they look for the man of the peace, they go into the man of peace's house, and in that house they pray for the sick, they eat all that's put before them and they set a home group in there. They then go off and look for another. And that's one home group. So now they keep connected. They never disconnect. And so then they'll go and that person begins to do likewise. And so it just expands phenomenal. And people are growing. Like these guys are seeing the spirit like I've never seen before. It's absolutely wonderful. So it's really, really different to, to what I've seen. But how it's in, in Australia, I have no idea. Okay. 
That's the key. Find the man of peace. This is the scriptural pattern. In other words, find the one whose heart's right. Find the one whose heart's open. Find the one who's hungry for God and loves people. That's the man of peace. See, if you plant the house church with the, the house that doesn't like people, <laughs> it's not going to work too well. You know, watching the clock, can't wait, they've got to be out of here by nine. Phew, well, that's finished. That won't work. That's the wrong spirit. But when the man of peace, he's got the heart for it. And remember, someone else might believe in it, but his heart's actually for this. That's where the body has to work together and we complete, not compete. Let the, let the church down the road do something different. They'll, they'll probably do it better than we can because everyone has to move with the anointings that God gives. We complete, not compete. Oh dear, thank you Jesus. Okay, so there is this uh, phenomenon that's happening and it's happening very, very strongly in the world today, the whole undercurrent of church growth, multiplying churches and church planting, raising up many, many, many pastors. There's another move that you and I would recognise and are part of, simply called a charismatic move. Charismatic in the base of the word charis, Greek word charis meaning gifts. Uh, people who are realising again you're gifted in the spirit, that you have an anointing on your life to minister with gifts and, and expressions of God to meet needs. And this whole charismatic movement is a, is a huge movement. It's innumerable. They try and put statistics on it, but it's just everywhere. People moving in the Holy Ghost. And now that charismatic move has moved to the place of maturity, we're recognising the apostolic anointing, recognising the prophetic anointing. It's come to fullness in this hour. So under the move of God, don't criticise someone who says, well, I'm really called for the personal evangelism, it's my passion. Agree with them and help them and encourage them, but also encourage them to see, yeah, but there's also this happening. There are those who are called to make sure the church is right and to dig deep in the word and to teach doctrine and to make sure everything's in order in the house of God. And there are those who are also called to plant churches and multiply uh, the gifts all over the, the city, the nation. There are those who are moving in the Holy Ghost with power. Some people say, well, I, I don't like that group and I don't want to be part of that, but it's too bad. If you want to be in the move of God, all these undercurrents interplay and they cross and they move and they weave. That's where we have to be so open in the spirit. I mean, I've told you a few times I have a, a, a sister who is a Roman Catholic who is an evangelist and uh, she, her ministry, as far as she believes in God, is to make sure them priests and them nuns are saved. I know that sounds strange and all her Protestant friends said, get out of the Catholic Church, get out of the Catholic Church. She said it's the biggest mission. 50% of churchgoers in the nation go to Catholic churches and she's right in the middle. Hallelujah. So who am I to say, get out of there, get out of there. She's getting them saved, getting them speaking in tongues. I mean by the hundreds. All I'm saying is this, don't criticise what we don't understand. Let's move with what we do understand and let's have grace for the rest. Because God knows what he's doing. So in the midst of all that's happening with this undercurrent of God, it's in a culture, and this is what I was really agonising with God, Lord, keep defining to me the day in which we live. You know, I could still think back numbers of years to an older generation that thought like this and felt like that, but it's changed. It's changed so rapidly. A number of points that I believe are vital for us today. In the cultural context or the signs of our times, we have a massively growing urban world. I'm talking worldwide. Most people now live in big cities and mega cities. There are still lots of people in smaller areas, but this whole trend of urbanisation is enormous. And that has to have a wineskin that addresses what it means to live in a big city. A big city is different from a small community where you can build relationships more easily. In our city, it's a battle to know the neighbours. Not in every instance, but in many instances. People are shut off, they're isolated, they're independent, they're cold because of the self-protection of their heart with all the stuff that happens in big cities and mega cities. But this is the reality that you and I have to address. What kind of wineskin is effective in the urbanisation of our world? Secondly, unparalleled instability and geopolitical disunity. In other words, geographically and politically, there's such disunity in the world, probably like never before. 
well, in my understanding. And so you've got this huge battle of how to address unparalleled instability and geopolitical disunity. What kind of wineskin? What kind of expression of God? How do we get the Prince of Peace into the hearts of those who are deeply, deeply distressed? Thirdly, there's an explosion of knowledge. We've had a te- technological revolution going for many, many years, many, many years, but it's, I mean, I don't even know the words. I go and visit some family and friends and, you know, their four-year-olds are on the computers. And I'm just, I'm trying to find send at the top. And they'll tell you, oh, Uncle Phil, there. So we, we, and that's probably, that's probably the list of it. I don't know what else they do. I'm sure trying to find out how those three prongs fit into the three holes so you, you get it in and then press it on. No, I'm a bit further advanced than that. But we, we, have a, we, we should be able to address what's happening. Not only keeping the breast with the times, go ahead, God's ahead of the times. Online churches, people say, oh, how ridiculous. It's actually meeting enormous needs. Not entirely personal. doesn't help if you need to lay it on the hands. However, there's something that's addressing what's happening in our world today. I'm just throwing this out for us to think about in the spirit. Fourthly, the world has become like a village in the sense that travel, communication and cultural interchange is just at, just at your fingertip. In other words, the whole world is now seen as a village. In other words, we can just have influence anywhere, anytime, internet, but also travel, communication, cultural exchange. It's different. Pervasive social change, moving rapidly towards a one world outlook. We need to stand together as a world. What's that going to lead to? One world government. Antichrist, one world dictator. It's probably in the flesh now, but certainly you can see it coming. The, uh, I won't even describe all that's happening but you and I know the nations, the confederacy of nations gathering together with tremendous strength and power, pervasive social change, the impending one world order just probably already well and truly started. Sixthly, an age of ethical, philosophical and religious ferment. Religious ferment is probably the worst of all of them because people have an expectation that religion will have some answers of love, peace, joy and all the things that the human heart needs. And so one of the greatest disappointments in our age is the fact that people are disillusioned with religion worldwide. Unfortunately, what that's done, it's bred a new form of atheism. And they say that atheism now is probably the fastest growing inverted commas religion. That we hate religion and there is no God. And it's becoming the roots of hurt, the roots of disillusionment, the roots of pain about even our own divisions as Christians and Christians speaking against them and them and you know, this whole thing. It's, it's a fermenting mess. This is the age in which we live. You might think, oh no, no, I, I, my world is beautiful. Well, this is the real world all around your beautiful little plot there. And the seventh point that I felt in my spirit was this, a widespread moral decay. So there's always been moral decay but now it's accepted and it's not moral decay, it's just the personal expression of how you feel. So if it's not called a problem or a sin or an aberration, there's not going to be any, any looking for an answer for healing and deliverance. So why, why am I saying all this? That's the world we live in, I believe it's Perth, I believe it's Australia and yet we are in a move of God. The move of God is not for us, the move of God is to take the wine to this hurting world. That's why God is moving. His heart is for the people who don't know. He loves us. We know he loves us. But he wants us to be so empowered, so equipped and, and to carry the anointing to where it's needed. Now, whilst you and I are carrying pain of the past, to that degree you can't carry the anointing. In that area, that's all. I'm not being harsh on anybody. Whilst you're carrying sickness and disease, and I know what that's all about. While you're carrying that stuff at that level and in that measure, you can't carry the anointing. You can in other areas. What I'm saying is this, God wants all the rubbish out so that more glory can come in. I believe there's three phases that you and I have seen in the move of, of our own salvation and it's rapidly, rapidly, rapidly changing. Number one, the whole outpouring of the spirit that you and I are enjoying promise of Joel 2 fulfilled in Acts 2 and now increasing to the former and latter reign before the return of Jesus. We're, we're, we're now at the phase with the initial outpouring, we're now ready for the deluge.
values the whole thing as increasing since the outpouring of Pentecost and now before the return of the Lord a worldwide deluge. Why? Because the rain matures the crop, it matures the harvest for the final ingathering. So this is the purpose and timing. It's no coincidence that there's a deluge coming because the whole world has been prepared for the final harvesting and you and I have been prepared to carry the glory through evangelism and through healthy churches and through multiplying churches and through the life of the Spirit to where the hurting people are in this kind of world. Number one, the outpouring of the Spirit has brought forth a regeneration of our own spirits. Hallelujah. You know, Colossians 1.27, Christ in us, the hope of glory. His divine life now living in and through our beings. Titus chapter 3, by regeneration we are saved. Number one, there's a regeneration happening. So many, many people. Number two, there's a transformation happening of the soul. Regeneration of the spirit, transformation of the soul. And there are many people fighting the transformation of the soul, saying, I don't need to deal with this anymore. I'm in the glory. Well, your spirit can be in the glory and your soul can be half in hell. In other words, the brokenness and the pain and the anguish of unresolved issues will still rise up even if you're in the glory. I know people in the glory, they manifest gold dust and they're absolutely in the glory. The next day they're having a fisticuffs. I'm thinking, that ain't the kind of glory I want to carry. I want to carry glory in the spirit that transforms the soul, that glorifies the body, that finally glorifies the Lord. I'm not speaking against anything, I'm speaking for something. That if you want the renewing of the spirit and the life of the spirit, it's got to also overflow to a transformation of the soul. Transformation of the soul is sanctification. It's, it's a lifelong process, but I think we can speed it up. You know, sometimes I used to sing a song, you know, to the Lord. How long, how long till I'm changed to be like you? I mean, I, I had tears pouring down my face. Jeanette did too. I sounded so bad. And I'd sing it again, how long, how long, till I am like you. I meant it, how long, how long, it seems so long. But you know what the answers used to be? As long as you take. <laughs> he wasn't crying and slipping, oh what a sweet song, as long as it takes son. In other words, get up and move ahead, take another giant step, come on, come out of the past into the future. It's not God who holds, you know, that withholds anything, how long, as long as you take to address the issue. As soon as you move into truth, you'll change. Thirdly, not only transformation of the soul, here's, here's the most exciting and wonderful thing, a glorification of the body. 1 Corinthians 15 says, we will have glorified bodies and we're moving now into the realm of glory which will cause us, I believe, to walk in divine health. If you don't see that as part of the end time vision, you won't even aim for it. God's coming back for a perfect church, glorious church, no spot, no wrinkle, no blemish. I believe we will walk in divine health when we see Jesus, we're already changed to be like him. Some people say, when I see him, then I'll get changed. Someone says, you can't see him till you are changed. 1 John 3 says this, whoever wants to see him prepares himself. Whoever wants to see him gets ready. The bride gets ready. The bride is purified before the coming of the Lord. So there's an urgency, yes, praise God for the regeneration of your spirit and my spirit. It's happened, it's past tense, thank you Jesus. But let the transformation of the soul, let it continue. Let that word be applied, let the truth go into the deep areas, pull out the roots, forgive, repent, let all that stuff go. And then to the measure that that happens, the glory then floods the soul, the glory floods the soul. You know, you know people who are truly in the glory. I understand the manifestations of God and I love it, you know me, I love it. But I'm not silly either. I want to see the nature of Christ coming forth. I want to see not just a manifestation of God, I want to see a habitation of God. I want to see God feeling so happy to stay, not just in our spirit, but to stay with us. You know, you can carry the anointing home today. You can have it in your house. You can keep it for days and weeks. Eventually, we'll learn how to stay in the glory. We'll stay in the glory where our whole spirit, soul and body will be untouched by all the things around us. You'll be in that place. I know people who are almost like that. They shine. Any time of day, there's a nature that you know is not going to, it's not going to bark at you and it's not going to bite at you, it's not going to growl at you. You just know there's a refinement of character that you can go to them and the same sweet, compassionate Christ is going to come forth. I know people like that. Unfortunately, I'm not one of them. I, I'm aiming to be one of them. I know, I've had a Baptist auntie who's like that. She just sit with Jesus, doesn't believe in tongues, thinks, you know, looks for my footprints on the ceiling after I've left thinks I'll probably climb the wall when she's gone to, you know, anyway. 
And Auntie Maisie, her name was, she was the sweetest Christian woman, pure, holy, clean. Lived with Jesus, loved Jesus, had a spare chair for Jesus, talked, they all thought she was a crackpot. Lived in the glory. Without even ever talking the language we talk, just lived in the glory. Because it's not about the language. It's about the experience of being one with God. Hallelujah. So that's a lot this morning and just anyway, that's what was there. What's there came out. 